What's going on, Disney fans? It's Disney Dan here, but wait a minute. Why am I on the Defunctland YouTube? Dan, let's skip the dumb intro skit and just get this thing going. Sounds good. Another top five video? Make it top 10. We're going for the big bucks. Speaking of big bucks, did you know that you could win money by playing trivia with the free Swag IQ app? Games are at 8 p.m. Eastern, Sunday through Thursday. Whoa, Kevin, are, are you all right? You're talking kind of weird. Wait, did we get sponsored by the wonderful people at Swag IQ, where anyone that answers the game's 10 trivia questions correctly gets to split a daily jackpot? Wow, we are really cashing in. Oh yeah. Standing like a weapon on the field to get some. On the real, we appear to get gone. Victory is ours, bring the chip home. Galactic, and I'm looking to get more. Raise it up, see what you don't know. Running like the blood, bumping from the pressure of a dream in the rush. We crush whatever we touch. Where you been, y'all, everyone know. You know what I'm saying? Opening on July 17th, 1955, Disneyland Park in Anaheim, California has operated for over 60 years. It might have the richest and most complex history of any theme park in the world. Along with this comes a variety of attractions, shops, and experiences that have gone by the wayside. Today, we are going to be talking about 10 in particular. These are the top 10 extinct opening day Disneyland attractions. Frontierland needed a mascot and a big attraction to pull in crowds and give them something entertaining. And no one man better suited that legendary position than Davy Crockett himself. The dusty, barren corner of the park featured a large wooden fort that held a very popular Davy Crockett arcade, a shooting gallery full of fun gags and interesting lore. The neighboring Davy Crockett Museum featured a few showcases including an Alamo exhibit with two life-size wax figures of Fess Parker and Buddy Epson, a historical firearms display sponsored by the NRA, and a recreation of a frontier mercantile that served as a themed gift shop. The building would also serve for the occasional Davy Crockett character meet and greet where guests could get photos and interact with the legendary hero. The museum portion of the attraction wasn't too popular and quickly closed, with the wax figures moving out to Tom Sawyer's Island. As Frontierland continued to grow and technology improved, a new shooting gallery, the Frontierland Shooting Exposition, opened in the 80s, leading to the original arcade to eventually close and reopen as another gift shop experience. The original Davy Crockett Arcade helped pave the way for many Disney parks to feature some sort of fancy shooting gallery. And while not much remains of the original Davy Crockett experience, the foundation and spirit of Frontierland that he created still lives on today. In the 1950s, television was dominated by shows depicting the Wild West, namely, conflicts between cowboys and Native Americans. This staple of pop culture found its way into Frontierland on opening day in the form of the Indian Village. Located right next to Aunt Jemima's Pancake House, the small village exhibit featured the ceremonial dance circle and a full-blooded Native chief. In a surprisingly progressive performance system, Disney would contract various tribes for six-month stints at the park to demonstrate their culture to the guests, before rotating them out for a new tribe to share their unique traditions. However, this Indian village wouldn't last too long, as it would be quickly moved to the Rivers of America in 1956, where it would be greatly expanded in comparison to the opening day version. The Disneyland that you know today is not the Disneyland that the public knew in 1955. While every corner of the park is now packed with an attraction and no space is necessarily wasted, 60 years ago the land of the land was sparse and empty. Over in Frontierland, families could fish, picnic, and just relax in the wide open prairie pastures, a stark contrast to the fast-paced thrill ride that now sits in its place. And for Frontierland's signature attraction, was it an animatronic musical review? Was it a runaway mine train? No, it was mules. Just mules. Groups of 10 would hop on their own mule and be led through the tall rock formations and desert-like conditions of Frontierland. This live animal attraction, called the Mule Pack, lasted in the park for nearly 20 years, occasionally getting a facelift as the Frontierland area expanded. When the park built the mining village of Rainbow Ridge, the mule ride changed its name to the Rainbow Ridge Pack Mules. And then again, after Nature's Wonderland Mine Train opened, the attraction was renamed Pack Mules Through Nature's Wonderland some incredibly original and creative naming by the park's team. By the end, you would pass through a small village, sections of rock formations filled with animatronic animals, and slowly trace the trails of an old mine train. With close to 75 working mules in the parks at any given time, the maintenance of live animals was burdensome and unpredictable. The mules would often refuse to move, which didn't make for much of a ride, and if the cast member forced them to move, the situation got even worse. Also, mules would often decide to follow their own heart rather than the pre-approved path. 
When Disneyland announced their new e-ticket roller coaster, Big Thunder Mountain, in the 70s, most of Frontierland, including the pack mules, were packed up and shipped off into the desert. The pack mule attraction was one of a kind for Disneyland, with no other park featuring anything remotely similar. Disney's signature Circle Vision 360 films have been featured in multiple Disney parks throughout the world, and the first film debuted in Disneyland's Tomorrowland on opening day. Presented as Circa Rama USA, the first film to debut was named A Tour of the West. Sponsored by American Motors, the 12-minute film utilized groundbreaking technology designed by Disney legends. The concept apparently came from a conversation between Ub Iwerks and Walt Disney, in which Iwerks was explaining issues that the crew of the film Westward Ho! The Wagons was facing when trying to adapt the newly introduced Cinemascope process. This is when Disney asked Iwerks if there was a way to make a film that extended the screen even more, perhaps 360 degrees around the entire audience. What Iwerks and his team were able to produce was more impressive than any previous attempts at cinematic immersion. The resulting exhibit in Tomorrowland, as with other earlier Disneyland attractions, had varying names. These included American Motors Circa Rama Exhibit, American Motors Exhibit, American Motors Present Circa Rama, and just Circa Rama. In the sign directly outside the show building, the Circa Rama logo was presented in black letters, except the letters C A R, which were colored red, just in case you didn't realize that the exhibit was sponsored by American Motors. To further drive home the sponsorship, I see what you did there. Dan. It's my turn? Yeah, yeah, sorry. To further emphasize the sponsorship, American Motors placed five cars on the floor of the theater. The appliance company Kelvinator, which had recently been absorbed into the American Motors Corporation, also had a variety of kitchen and home appliances placed around the show building. The film itself was shot using 11 cameras placed in a circle on a specially made rig. How did that rig get around? Well, it was placed on top of none other than the American Motors Rambler, both a sports fastback and roomy enough for the family too. And you thought our sponsorship was shameless. By the way, big thanks to Swag IQ for sponsoring this video. The Tour of the West film comprised of exterior shots of landmarks such as Monument Valley, the Grand Canyon, Las Vegas, and the streets of Los Angeles. The film was projected above the audience by 11 projectors with small black strips in between each screen. This was done in order to avoid the blind spots created by the camera rig. Tour of the West lasted until 1960, where it was replaced by a new Circle Vision film, America the Beautiful. Do you enjoy snacking at the Tomorrowland Pizza Port, or is it now Pizza Planet? Uh, regardless, of course you don't, because the pizza there is awful. It's practically made out of cardboard, and tastes like it's been rehydrated from some weird NASA-approved astronaut freeze-dried packet. Long before the Pizza Port was dishing out gross quick-serve pizza, the space was occupied by the opening day attraction Rocket to the Moon, a centerpiece of the Disneyland Spaceport in Tomorrowland. The Rocket to the Moon attraction took guests on a simulated space trip to the moon and back using nothing more than two large screens and circular stadium ride seating. Outside the attraction, a massive 80-foot tall rocket ship greeted you, the tallest structure in the park at the time, three feet taller than the castle. It was placed outside the attraction to give guests a reference for the ship that they were about to board. I'd like to give you some idea about the rocket ship itself and explain some of the more interesting highlights of our operation here. So when the flight gets underway, you'll be able to see by watching the upper screen what's ahead of you and by watching the lower screen, you can see what you've left behind. Upon entering the futuristic looking space station, you were directed to one of two rockets, Luna or Diane, changed a few years later to Arcturus and Polaris. In this short queue area, there were special weighing stations that actually told guests what their weight would be once they landed on the moon. After being directed to their rocket, guests would enter and sit into a large round room. The room featured a screen above their heads to show where the rocket was going, and a central screen on the floor to show a bird's eye view of where the rocket was taking off from. The floor would begin to rumble as the rocket took off thanks to large speakers hidden under the floor. Then guests could peer down at the central screen, showing an ever increasingly distant Anaheim below the ship as the screen up above them showed the moon growing closer and closer. Eventually, the guests would reach the moon, slowly passing around its orbit while learning facts from the movie's voiceover before flying back down to the surface and landing like one of Elon Musk's new fancy rocket pods. This was seriously ahead of its time. Over the many years and many facelifts of Tomorrowland, the ride would get rethemed, eventually ending on Mission to Mars, until, of course, the major renovation to Tomorrowland in 1998, when the ride was gutted and the show building was transformed into a pizza joint. A new rocket, about 30% smaller, was built outside to promote Coca-Cola products, and the only remnant of the ride today is the high-peaked front facade painted over after the Douglas Aircraft Company dropped their sponsorship. 
One of the most recognizable features of Disneyland's Tomorrowland is the lagoon that currently hosts Finding Nemo Submarine Voyage. But this was of course not present on opening day. It would not be until 1959 that the original Submarine Voyage would open in Tomorrowland. So what was in that spot when the park opened? A lagoon. A much less impressive lagoon. Well, we ought to go down to the boat landing. Ronnie Reagan, are you there? Take it away. Thank you very much, Art. And here on the Lake of Tomorrowland, we have boats made out of fiberglass, and they're as strong and safe as anything afloat. An attraction named the Tomorrowland Boats allowed guests to drive small boats in laps around the small pond. You heard that right. Guests were given the wheel. Surprisingly, this turned out to be a bad idea. The small motors of the boat would overheat when guests attempted to speed up, and a towboat had to come around and pick up the stranded vessels. On top of this, the smoke released by the motors was dense and problematic. Disneyland's management came up with the brilliant solution to enclose the motor within the boat. In another shocking twist, while this did reduce smoke, it only made the overheating problem worse. Another attempted solution was to add a cast member to each boat, which drastically increased the operating cost of the attraction. The attraction was eventually renamed to the Phantom Boats, but the issues proved to be too much for the small lagoon, and it would close in August of 1956. It was the first attraction to close, and it is still the shortest-lived Disneyland attraction. It's almost hard to remember that before Omnimovers and massive rotating theaters, attractions were sometimes nothing more than a large, moving floor that passed by windows displaying gorgeously detailed paintings. This was the case for Space Station X-1, a futuristic experience that took guests high into orbit to a remote space station that overlooked vast, distant, picturesque views of the Earth below. Upon boarding the large circular yellow space station, you would begin your journey on the east coast as a sunrise crested over the horizon, and by the end of your journey, you would witness a lovely sunset on the west coast. The show building was a large circular room with a massive painted portrait of the earth that wrapped around the exterior. The mural was textured and 3D, giving the illusion of a live topographical view of the Earth from orbit. The black space above the painting was lined with pinhole lights to simulate distant stars, while clouds and storms were projected onto the surface. Close by, one of our studio artists was painting a miniature model of what was to be our cyclorama. When completed in full scale, it will be seen in Tomorrowland, and will give the illusion of a panoramic view of America as seen from a space station traveling in an orbit 500 miles above the Earth. You would travel around the room in front of your small 3 foot by 4 foot window, peering out over the painting that showed off small cities, rolling mountains, and even a deep forest with a fire that billowed smoke. Eventually, the ride was updated and renamed Satellite View of America after the first real U.S. satellite provided aerial views of the world in 1958. But low attendance and disinterest in space led to the attraction closing in early 1960, replaced by the Art of Animation exhibit. Visiting present-day Disneyland can be a fantastic experience. The rides, shows, and various entertainment options provide fun for all ages. But there is one thing missing in the happiest place on Earth. That is, of course, a science museum. While this is absent from Disneyland's current attraction lineup, on opening day, such an experience did exist. The Monsanto Hall of Chemistry was a free walkthrough museum focusing on the wonders of chemicals and plastics. The outside of the building featured an illustration of an atom, with fountains and lights dancing along the wall. The inside was an exhibit promoting Monsanto's creation of various products. The signature exhibit in the Hall of Chemistry was the Chemitron, eight tubes each containing a different basic natural element that was used by Monsanto to create over 500 chemicals. The idea of this aged about as well as an exhibit called the Magic of Lobotomies would have, but it lasted a surprising 11 years, eventually closing in September 1966 due to declining interest from the public and to better utilize the large building in Tomorrowland. In 1967, the space would be transformed into another Monsanto-sponsored attraction, Adventures Through Inner Space, which would eventually be replaced by the building's current tenant, Star Tours. The Tomorrowland area of Disneyland was one of the most heavily sponsored parts of the park, with tons of companies trying to put a face and brand on the future. And while most rides were sponsored by big corporations, some took it a step further by actually installing exhibits of their futuristic products in the park. Which is what brings us to the Kaiser Aluminum Hall of Fame. The bright, shiny, lightweight material was the medal of the future in 1955, and the Aluminum Hall of Fame was there to dazzle guests with all its splendid wonders. The self-guided walkthrough tour attraction featured dozens of wild creations all out of aluminum. First, guests were greeted by the Kaiser Aluminum Pig, the mascot for the attraction, alongside a massive aluminum telescope structure. 
Next, guests would see more practical uses of aluminum with appliances, building materials, and various showcases. You eventually ended up in the final large hall that housed the future of aluminum. The two big highlights of the final hall were the Time Sphere, a massive, highly polished aluminum sphere that displayed medieval knights, firemen, and astronauts, all wearing aluminum in one form or another. And the brightest star in the world of metals, a large metallic glowing star. And now we'll take you into the future again and the aluminum exhibit and show you the aluminum telescope. Bob Cummings, take it away. This is Dr. Heinz Haber, and I'm sure you will remember him from Walt Disney's Tomorrowland. Mr. Haber has a very interesting experiment to show us here as we stand in front of this giant aluminum telescope, which was built especially for the Disneyland show. Soon after the park opened, Kaiser felt that Disney was spreading himself too thin and introducing too many possible competitors to the Kaiser brand. They immediately wanted out, but Walt convinced them to stick around for a few years longer. But eventually, the company and their lavish display packed up and left the theme park the moment their five-year contract expired. Today, the building that once housed the shiny metal now houses a robot made of shiny metal as it was absorbed into the show building needed for Star Tours. Disney, being such a family-oriented brand, rarely tries to appeal to a strictly older audience. Rarely. That said, when Disneyland first opened, Main Street USA featured a small little shop with the sign, Intimate Apparel, Brasiers, Torcelettes. Oh yeah. Walk inside and it is in fact a lingerie shop, presented by Hollywood Maxwell Brasier Company of Los Angeles. City of Angels, baby. Inside, you will meet the wonderful Wizard of Bras. Speaking from a smooth 8-track and turning round and round on a rotating stage, the wizard takes you through the history of the land down undies. See the unmentionables of recent history in 3D illusion boxes and watch those undies appear or you get the idea. Kevin, you're, you're having a little too much fun with this. We should probably wrap it up. Fine. That's basically it. It was a lingerie store right next to Grandma's Baby Shop, which Intamin Apparel, Brasier's Torcelettes actually outlived. The Wizard of Bras and the store only lasted until January of 1956, before it was absorbed by the neighboring Glass and China Shop. Special thanks to Disney Dan for helping out with this video. Go check out his YouTube channel with the link in the description, and don't forget to download Swag IQ with the link below. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Defunct Land. Oh man, you've got some issues. Second version telling you I'm ready to go, letting you know, cause I'm never alone. The ones that I roll with are incredibly known for getting down to the nitty gritty. If you really women, let's go. Moves made, dues paid, most talk, but don't do a thing. We certified, observe as I come through and give a true display. We champions, understand me standing under a victory canopy. Canopy, the enemy was hitting keys, ready to drive at top speed. Let's get it out. Wake up, victory's mine. On top, still on the grind. Gotta go get it right now. Holla at me if you with me. It's Time.